The Economist magazine recently characterized the state of innovation as, quote, somewhere between dire straits and dead. Are our most inventive days behind us? Joining us now to help answer that question, in Washington, D.C., Michael Lind. He's policy director of the Economic Growth Program at the New America Foundation. And with us here in studio, Armin Yalnesian, senior economist with the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives. Brian Gray, lawyer and senior partner and patent and trademark agent at the Norton Rose Group. And Giuseppina D'Agostino, founder and director of IP Osgood, the intellectual property law and technology program at the Osgood Hall Law School at York University, where she's also a professor and first time for you on this program. Pina, nice to have you here. Brian, first time for you as well. Okay, let me, that doesn't mean I'm not happy to see you again, Armin. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I just, you know, we like to welcome first timers for, for the first time. Here's from The Economist. Let's read this. In a 2011 ebook, Tyler Cowen, an economist at George Mason University, argued that the financial crisis was masking a deeper and more disturbing, quote, great stagnation. It was this which explained why growth in rich world real incomes and employment had long been slowing and since the year 2000 had hardly risen at all. The various motors of 20th century growth, some technological, some not, had played themselves out and new technologies were not going to have the same invigorating effect on the economies of the future. For all its flat screen dazzle and high bandwidth pizzazz, it seemed the world had run out of ideas. That's just last month in The Economist. Now, based on this article, we also put a little poll together for our website. We put the call out on Facebook and Twitter and asked people, tell us what the greatest invention of all time was. And here's what we got back. Let's put this graphic up if we can. Would you believe indoor plumbing was number one? Almost half the people came back and said indoor plumbing was number one. You can see some saying the steam engine, the telegraph, broadcast radio, personal computers, smartphones, Nobody said anesthetic, which I thought was pretty important. But anyway, there we go. Indoor plumbing at number one. Michael, let's get this started. The steam engine was invented in 1780. The personal computer as a sort of everyday household product, 1980s. People like Tyler Cowen think it's unlikely that we're ever going to see inventions capable of transforming our world like those ever again. Is he right? Well, let's wait 200 years before we uh, declare innovation over. I think he is right that we're not seeing the kind of dramatic deployment of uh, breakthrough technologies comparable to, say, the jet engine in the 1950s or the uh, personal computer in the 1980s. But technologies have a life cycle like people. There are infants, then there are adolescents, and finally there are mature technologies. I think we're in a period where a lot of the technologies associated with the information revolution are reaching maturity, uh, while in the laboratory, we're continuing to see some very promising breakthroughs in everything from materials like graphene to uh, research and supercomputing. I mean, one of the things we hear is that because of the Great Recession, we're in the midst of a period of great economic stagnation, which is harming our ability to innovate. You buying that? I think there is huge amounts of innovation that is uh, just under the surface when it comes to nanotechnology, when it comes to things like 3D printing, artificial intelligence and robots, this thing that they call remote telepresence, which is permitting us to do all sorts of things from healthcare to mining to waging war from a distance as if you're doing it through a screen. These things have not really fully come on screen and there's a brilliant TED talk that was posted in 2008 by Kevin Kelly. That, was, that, that who is a co-founder of Wired magazine, mm -hmm. who talked about the next 5,000 days of the web. The web had only been around for 5,000 days at that point. And when you watch that today, um, so many of the things he's talked about, about the embedding of technology into our everyday life has come true. I think we haven't begun to see mm -hmm. the uh, floraison, the, the blossoming of what we know how to do and biomimicry also. Hmm. So, Pina, the rumors of innovation's demise are vastly overrated? Completely. And huh. I could not agree more with Armin and Michael. I mean, I teach this stuff, and I alone can't keep up with the new technologies. I start every class by just uh, scoping the landscape to see all the new inventions that came up just in the past week. And so, just to give you an example, Michael was talking about maturities of industries. Here in Canada, we can have a homegrown industry with stem cells. I mean, stem cells were discovered in Canada in the 1960s. And now we're at a stage where in Japan in 2006, there was a big discovery with induced pluripotent stem cells, which was basically taking your own skin, 
reprogramming it and putting it back to a stem cell state where you could then have any number of cells from heart cells that could become a heart hmm. to lung cells, a lung, et cetera, et cetera. So and we're among the world leaders at this. We are, we are. So I think the best is yet to come. Hmm. Who said that? Frank Sinatra. <laughs> Sinatra saying it, Tony Bennett saying Smart it. Smart guy. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Where are you coming from on this? Well, I'd like to disagree, but I can't. I have, uh, I have, uh, and of course I see, this is what I do all day long, see new technologies. and. And uh, they are, do believe that uh, we have to distinguish between the conceptual in, uh, invention of the f foundational tech, uh, science and the application of it. It takes, there is a, 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 a uh, lag time, and uh, we do see that uh, there are peaks and troughs where there's a rapid increase in the application of the technology. Uh, we may be in a period now where we're really doing more foundational work, which will then result in a rapid uh, growth at some point in the future. Uh, I, I, all of the things that, that uh, were, Armin mentioned, uh, material science, nanotechnology, 3D printing, biotechnology, biomimicking of uh, using, um, using biological machines to replace silicon chips, uh, stem cells, personalized medicine, our, our understanding of the genetic code and of the human body. All of these things promise to have tremendous, uh, be tremendous breaks. Now, are they going to be as good as indoor plumbing? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I happen to like indoor plumbing, so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, maybe not. And maybe, uh, you know, we, uh, many of the low, one, one could argue, as the economist does, that the low-hanging fruit, we've already picked the low-hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. But I'm not so sure that, that Edison or uh, that, that Watt or that the people, that, that these people thought that this was low-hanging fruit. I mean, I think at the time when they made the telegraph, the telephone, the steam engine, these things were not things that, that were low-hanging for them. They, they were things that they hadn't... It was uh, miraculous. They, they really were yeah. miraculous. Yeah. So the things that are miraculous, yeah. we can't actually really truly envision right now, I think. so. Hmm. Uh, uh, I can't deny that there, the economists' arguments about the uh, slowing down of our GDP growth, uh, that is uh, something that's, that is happening, it appears. Uh, well, let me follow up yeah. with Armin on that, because yeah. I, I do want to do a bit of a comparison between the economy as it exists today and say, let's just, pulling out of a hat, the 1970s, for example. When you look at the differences between the economy then of 40 or 50 years ago and today, what jumps out at you? The growing concentration of ownership um, and uh, consequently of income. So inequality and climate change and inequality are those two kind of inescapable and inconvenient truths of our era. And what we do know about the, um, the effect of the biggest global crisis that we've seen since the 1930s is in its wake came a wave of corporate, is continuing a wave of corporate concentration that is further con concentrating the ownership of lots of things, including intellectual property. And of course, we had that massive fight in the United States to stop online piracy. And that is the fight of our era, era. also, the, the channeling of the intellectual commons uh, will either slow or accelerate how we expand our understanding and take advantage of these innovation breakthroughs and how we apply them. That's the key. I want to follow up with Michael Lind on that. Given the way Armin has described the differences between the economy of 40 or 50 years ago and today, does that stifle the kind of innovation that we need to keep progressing as a society in the way that we have? Well, not necessarily. Uh, I, I would push back a little bit. Uh, in industries where you have increasing returns to scale or network effects, like a lot of telecommunications industries, uh, some manufacturing, you naturally get a shakeout over time and you get a consolidation of a few oligopolistic or monopolistic firms in that sector. You may want to regulate them, uh, but, but there are, are natural economies of scale that you can exploit. I think the real danger is that we have kind of a two-speed economy where new technologies, including those associated with advanced manufacturing, like rapid prototyping, uh, are being applied to the physical goods sector, you know, to uh, the, the traded manufacturing sector. Where we're lagging behind is in the application of productivity to health care, to higher education, uh, to a lot of services. And so one of the challenges will be because, at least in the United States, uh, more than 85 percent of people work in the domestic service sector now. Applying technology to these kind of backward services will uh, lead to a lot of productivity gains that we have not yet enjoyed. Let's come, Pina, really back to first principles here sure. and just help people understand how this all starts with a patent. Okay. Tell us what a patent is and what it's supposed to do. Okay, well, a patent is basically 
could be a piece of paper, really, and it's protection over your creation, your invention. There's Who gives it to you? So it's the crown. The government gives it to you. You file an application at the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, and right now the term is 20 years. It used to be, when it first started back in England, 14-year term, which went by the apprenticeship period. So the whole scope of it was really a bargain between the state and the inventor. So the state says, okay, inventor, great work, amazing, we'll give you protection for that. And what does that mean? 20 years? 20 years to what? To exclusive rights. It's sort of like a deed on your house. You own your house, you can do whatever you want with it. In this case, you have a patent right over that invention. And that, nobody else can copy it. And nobody else could copy it. Okay. And we, ha we have that in Canada today. And it, how, how far back does it go in Canada, so, the history of patents? Oh, it goes back. Well, if we want to really trace it back, we could go to the... Uh, the Greek, ancient Greek times. Yeah, we, had a, but, we had a statue yeah. in Upper Canada, so there was a statue okay. going back to oh. well before Confederation. Yeah. Okay, yeah. 220 years, 250 years, yeah. something yeah. like yeah. that. But the, okay. the scope of it was really actually too, and it's that sort of ironic because patents now are seen as monopolistic, but the whole genesis of patents was really to eradicate monopolies. If you look at the start in England with the letters patent, as an example of a first letters patent that they gave was to give, um, so you'd apply to the crown and they gave you permission to, let's say, uh, sell playing cards. So imagine what that did at the time for others who were selling playing cards. All of a sudden they had no more business. So it put people out of business. Hmm. So it was really anti-competitive. And that's why the patent, the statute of monopolies, came into be to really stop that behavior. Brian, could you follow up on that? Because I have heard this criticism that, that a patent gives you a monopoly, and a monopoly actually doesn't spur on innovation. It stifles innovation. Well, the, uh, I mean, yes, I mean, there is, I think, uh, no real good way to answer this question uh, from, a, from a completely from an from a analysis point of view, except to say that in all the countries which have patent systems, innovation has been very rapid. Uh, there was patent, uh, there was a huge uh, uh, and very well used patent system in England in the 19th century and in the United States in the 19th century. There were patent fights. Uh, Edison had a patent fight over his uh, kinographic, his, his, his uh, movie machine. He had patent fights over the light bulb. Uh, he had, uh, Bell had fights over the telephone. In fact, uh, somebody, he beat out somebody in the patent office by six hours. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Morris had a had a had a fight. Went to the U.S. Supreme Court, and there was so there was uh, what for Morris Code? You mean for, for the for the Telegraph? Oh, for Telegraph, telegraph okay. yeah. So, uh, so uh, we have seen a vigorous uh, patent system with vigorous uh, litigation, vigorous protection, and it hasn't stifled the industrial revolution. And in fact, in those countries which have a patent system. Uh, for, and there are many other reasons, perhaps, why England, the United States, uh, Germany, etc., had the were the foundation of the Industrial Revolution. But there were there are countries now, like China and Japan, which which are very technologically advanced now, but which did not have a, a functioning patent system. So, it, well, patents, critics would say China just steals it; they don't need one. Well, uh, and that possibly that's it is the case that when you're behind you don't want to give exclusive rights to, to mm -hmm. foreigners because the patent system is international you can you can use it to gain uh, to protect uh, rights from one country into another country L Michael Lind you any, anything here you want to take issue with of what you've just heard about the, the about the history of patents or how they either help or deter innovation along the way well, the United States uh, grew rich in the 19th century by stealing intellectual property from Great Britain. <laughs> we set up our uh, textile industry uh, in the 19th century by means of industrial espionage. So uh, uh, countries that are trying to catch up, like the United States then and China today, uh, tend to be a bit lax, shall we say, in patent enforcement. Uh, in the United States, going all the way back to uh, Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson in the 1790s, he set up the American patent system. There's been a concern to balance the need to provide uh, entrepreneurs and inventors with reward with a need to prevent uh, individuals or companies from locking up basic breakthroughs in science and technology. And one technique that the United States used in the middle of the 20th century, particularly in World War II and the Cold War, the military was the, the largest initial customer for everything from uh, uh, a lot of aviation to uh, nuclear power and computers. Uh, and the U.S. Defense Department forced companies to pool patents in order to get defense contracts. And, and that's a very useful technique that other governments might emulate. Pina, let's do a little, maybe just a little more background here. Sure. We're, we're talking about, you talk about the steam engine, you talk about the telegraph, the telephone. 
patents on things right. that you can hold in your hand. Yeah. Now we're getting to a process where we're patenting ideas or concepts. Is that different? Well, in a sense, it is different in that more, more things, and you could put processes in that are subject to protection. But at the same time, we are doing, achieving the same thing. Because one thing that we haven't mentioned yet is that the whole object for a patent in return for that monopoly is that you actually give disclosure, full disclosure of what it is that you actually invented. And that's how it spurs innovation, because you have then many other experts in the community looking at what it is that you invented and trying to improve it. Okay. So at root, it's, it's the same thing. The only thing what it's doing is it's complicating things because we have many more patents and it's clogging up the system. But I can't, you know the cloud? Yeah. Where every, you know, all of the world's information, big data, hangs out? Yeah. I, you know, I can't hold that in my hand. I can hold an iPhone in my hand. I can't hold the, the cloud in my hand. Has that changed the way people innovate as a result of patenting ideas or notions or concepts as opposed to something you can actually hold in your hand? Well, we're, we're still protecting what intellectual property really is, is intellectual property. It's hmm. really different from a house. But so I think I, think I, think I should inter interrupt because I, I, you can't patent ideas. So you, you cannot, can, cannot patent ideas. So I, I just wanted to, uh, uh, you, you, you've given the, because the, the yeah, question, the question your question inherently suggests that, yeah. but it's not the case. And insofar, and this is the challenge, of course, is to try to differentiate between the idea right. and the practical application of the idea. I see. So you, ca you can't patent, uh, I mean, you could patent the steam engine, but you can't patent Boyle's Law and other things that were the sub-foundational principles of the steam engine. You can patent uh, an airplane wing but you can't patent the algorithm that the, makes the perfect uh, surface. You can patent the atomic bomb. You can't patent the, the, uh, the f f scientific concept, E equals MC squared. Can you patent the algorithm that Google uses to get search engine optimization and that kind of thing? Not as an algorithm, no. Not I think it's algorithm. absolutely clear that you cannot patent software per se. It must be embodied into some kind of technical uh, achievement. Now, this is where it becomes tricky. It becomes tricky to differentiate the, the idea from the uh, application of the idea and copyright you have the same problem yeah. the idea and the expression of the idea but it is uh, it is patent law has for many many years tried to and and has been has wrestled with this in fact the Morris case I mentioned went to the US Supreme Court in 1870 something and one of the claims was invalidated because Morris was trying to claim the idea of transmission of electrical signals over the in, over over wires uh, in, no matter how done whereas in fact the invention of the telegraph was really, or his invention was really the use of a repeater to allow the electrical signal to, to, to travel over distances. So the courts have said, no, you can't patent every way of doing something. You can't patent every, the idea. You can only patent the application of that idea for the specific application of the idea. Okay. Armin, you want in on this? Well, just to say that the whole idea behind patents is not just to reward the inventor and ha have an inve incentive, but that, those re that period of reward is extending. And I'll just use the example of patent medicines. Here in Canada, we have extended the patent on patent medicines a couple of times. And what is not happening is uh, the abundance that generics can bring to, say, third world countries. We almost had a piece of legislation that permitted, for the purposes of foreign aid, those patents to come off early so mm -hmm. that we could produce those uh, medicines generically and ship them to where, um, uh, for example, HIV, HIV antiretrovirals, or whatever they're yeah. called, mm -hmm. um, could be distributed at lower costs. So what patents can do is actually create a new form of abundance should we be able to lift the rent that comes off them. And it's all about the rent, mm. the rent of, you know, am I, am I renting access to the internet through whichever internet uh, service provider I've got? Am I renting access to a particular type of technology that could make me healthier? Who am I paying that rent to? And how much rent am I paying? And that's really what the, uh, the patent thing does, is who benefits from these innovations? Cui bono. Yeah. You were speaking Latin earlier, right? Yeah. Cui bono. But at the same time, though, I just want to add, it's, I think what we tend to do is to put so much attention to the patent laws when the patent laws alone are not the key card to innovation or fixing the system. It's like think, talking about the NHL and looking only to the quality of the hockey sticks. 
So if you just focus on the patent system alone, you have to consider the research and development, that dynamic e ecosystem, the um, tax system that's in place, the mm -hmm. regulatory structure, so all of that. And even within the patent system, I, I touched on it just before, I mean, it's getting quite messy filing and getting a patent. A patent examiner only has five to seven hours to even look at pages and pages of a patent application. Can you imagine what that's like? Someone sitting in the office gets this, this document, and they could be a biologist, but the application is somewhere in software. So they have to do all of that work, and there's very little time and resources. Do too many things get patented in this country? I, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think we actually have it right in, from a policy perspective, but I think we do need some tweaking in the system. So mm -hmm. that's where I would like to see some changes. And going back to what Armin was saying, I think looking at the concept of rent and the term of protection, absolutely. I think we need to look at maybe shortening some terms, looking at the context. So for drugs, maybe we could shorten it in some cases, lengthen it. If you let me, yeah, can I just follow yeah. up, Michael, on that for a second? Because this, about, I guess about 25 years ago, this was a huge issue when Brian Mulroney mm -hmm. was prime minister. Yeah. And he wanted to create a pharmaceutical you know, cluster of companies that would manufacture name drugs, mostly in Quebec. But of course, you had the generics who were you know, nipping at their yeah. heels saying, come on, 20 years is too much protection. Uh, we want yeah. the right to get in there, make these drugs cheaper, make them more plentiful for people to get at. Michael, have you got a view on where the sweet spot is on that? How, uh, how much patent protection uh, take the case of drug manufacturers? Do they need in order to keep making their discoveries, but not so much that they're actually preventing more people from getting at their works when they get into a generic situation? Well, Washington is full of a very well-paid pharma lobbyists who claim they need a ex extreme patent protection uh, for there to be any uh, biomedical advance at all. Uh, part of the problem in evaluating these claims is we don't really have a baseline of other options. Uh, using the patent system to spur innovation, whether in pharmaceuticals or anything else, is simply one of many methods. Another is giving prizes, for example, like the X Prize. Yet another is simply direct publicly funded R&D, the results of which become free at the moment they're developed. So I think it would be very helpful uh, in evaluating the, the claims of private industry if we relied on a suite of approaches like this and uh, didn't put all of our emphasis on uh, patents uh, uh, spurring innovation, particularly with drugs. Hmm. Pina, how do we do any of this, the prizes or public funding of R&D, that kind of thing? Well, there's lots of... Yeah, there's lots of that. There's more and more competitions that occur at the grassroots level. I know that at York, we try and encourage that. We have uh, Schulich School of Business that has a yearly prize here for new innovators. But I think we, need, we could be doing more, much more. Well, just one thing that you need to be aware of, that your audience needs to be aware of, is we're towards the 11th hour of negotiations for the Canada-Europe trade agreement. Right. And a huge part of that is about extending patent rights, intellectual property mm -hmm. rights primarily for the pharmaceutical manufacturers from Europe from whom we import something like five billion, sorry, $2.8 billion worth of prescription medications every year. And should they get what they're looking for, we will be paying a few billion dollars more just for the privilege of buying it from them. So these are big political yeah. stakes as well. It isn't just about how do you innovate. It's like what kind of a deal can you get at a trade table? I'm not marking you down yeah. as undecided on this CETA. <laughs> well, at, least, at least in terms of pharmaceuticals, this is like a huge issue where yeah. it's got nothing to do with the technology or the innovation. Just what kind of a deal can you get horse yeah. trading at the, hmm. at the trade table? So it's just something that people need to be aware of. Our governments, yeah. Brian, over the years have, have allowed, I guess, tax deductions of of billions upon billions of dollars for R&D. Is there any evidence that that actually works? Uh, you probably better ask Armin that. I'm not an economist, but I, I, I know that uh, certainly in my own experience, uh, many, many small companies rely heavily on research and development tax credits in order to get started. And uh, there had been some issues with them uh, not, uh, not using them and using them as trading things. And there had been some abuse, I believe, what, 10 or 15 years ago. But certainly, anecdotally, uh, the clients I deal with do rely on these tax credits uh, to get started, and it's particularly in the small, uh, medium-sized enterprises. And can you draw a line between the tax break received for R&D and success at the end of the day for your clients? 
I, it's not a, a direct uh, one to one. I mean, uh, many of these uh, companies uh, are, have a law, especially in the pharmaceutical. I mean, you know, everybody's always getting criticized in the pharmaceutical business, but it's about a very long lead time before it actually produces anything. There's a lot of testing has to be done to, uh, to determine its uh, the uh, safety and efficacy of the drugs. Uh, many of the compounds that are tested don't work, and so you know there's a lot of history of the amount of money that's spent. And when you've got a small company, particularly in the biotech area, uh, there's a very very long lead time, and those companies uh, have spent quite a lot of money, and eventually often they get uh, acquired by a larger companies. And uh, mm -hmm. and uh, so so the bottom line is no, you can't draw a direct can't line. Can't draw that line. But what do you think of these? Well, it's, we just have lots and lots of examples of the SRED credit, yeah. the Scientific Research yeah. and Education right. Development Threads. credit, uh, being utilized for doing things that companies would have done anyway. For example, billions upon billions that were used by the financial sector to um, automate. Uh, to put in ATMs and to upgrade their computers and stuff like that. They were going to do that anyway, so why the taxpayer is bailing them out to do that, which increases their productivity. You know, so there's these cases which are marginal. They're in a gray area. You don't know if a company would have done this anyway, and, they, and you would like to um, push their innovation. But in the case of um, ex, uh, extraction resource development, finance sector, pharmaceuticals, there's a lot of like you, you were pointing at the small and medium enterprises, but the big companies that are taking huge advantage of what's on the books to be able to basically increase their profit margin. You would prohibit for invest this. Uh, no, I'm not saying I would prohibit it. I'm just saying that there are some clear contraventions, that, but we keep laying off people that might be able to look into tax fraud. For example, we just laid off about uh, 5,800 people from CRA, Canada Revenue Agency, as part of our uh, downsizing and austerity, and a bunch of them came out of the ability to pursue tax fraud. Hmm. Okay. Our Small inventors still out there. I guess I should ask that differently. Not small inventors, um, because that suggests physical stature. I meant, <laughs> I meant the People little with guy. A little yeah. bit of money. Yeah, not, not too much money. A little little guy with a little money. You know that kind of thing. Uh, Pina, does that still exist? Oh, of course. I'm working with them right now. Um, can you give it? Well, I guess you're probably sworn to silence on a lot no, of this well, stuff. No, I, what can I you just, tell us? Well, I just started a small, uh, it's an, well, using the word small, yeah. <laughs> not in stature, uh, <laughs> innovation clinic at Osgood, partnering with the Ontario Centers of Excellence. Mm -hmm. And what we really try and do there is to tackle the gap that exists because it's so pricey to actually get a patent or to figure out what to do with the technology. And you have a lot of the little guys or little girls um, from universities that actually use a lot of publicly funded um, monies to come, that come up with inventions. So you'll have an inventor within the university or even in, in the Markham region. We work with the Markham Convergence Center. So they'll come. They don't know anything about what they should be doing. And they come to our students who do the work for free. We're partnered with a law firm, and we're trying to help these little guys uh, not become so jaded. And with little all means the what? Like put a dollar figure on it. Little means? No money. Zero. No money. They got nothing. Nothing. And that, that actually is the crux of the problem for these small yeah. innovators is lack of small cap venture exactly. capital. There's yeah. no angel capitalists exactly. out there. There's tons of dead money yeah. on corporate balance sheets, but it's yeah. very <laughs> difficult to get your hands on it to make these ideas exactly. go to work. Yeah. Can, can I ask how much you charge to help these folks get along? <laughs> well, it varies. Uh, I'd rather not say because of it, uh, because we do we do do uh, we do do some breaks for people who are are um, are smaller. Uh, it in fact we can't uh, if we really charge what it costs to draft a patent, a good patent, we pro we couldn't make money. Actually, we we it uh, it is. Uh, so what does it cost to draft a patent? Well, typically uh, you're talking the ten to fifteen thousand wow. dollar range for a patent yeah. application, wow. and that's uh, for an uh, application. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. But you've got to appreciate, see, what we haven't talked about is what is a patent. And we've yeah. talked about a patent in the general terms, yeah. but uh, what, what a patent is, is a disclosure of the technology. And more importantly, it's a, it claims the, uh, Pina talked about this, it's claiming the fences around the technology. Now, yeah. if you claim too broadly, you have an invalid patent. Yeah. If you claim too narrowly, you leave, you leave on the table things that allow people to engineer around. <laughs> so you yeah. need to understand uh, what is the actual invention and how to claim it in a way that covers the actual sco proper scope. Okay. And so that actually is a, pro a project that is very uh, diff different than many other legal tasks. And, uh, uh, and so, uh, frankly, 
it, it really does take that, that much time to so do. So this is yeah. bloody expensive, if I can put it that yes, way. Yes, if you want to do it. Yeah. Now, there are, there are t attempts to improve the system by uh, the U.S. has a provisional patent application, which doesn't require a claim. You can put it in the, into the patent <coughs> office uh, with a very rough disclosure, get a priority date, and then you have a year or two to perfect that. So there, there are systems in place to try to allow you to put something in place cheaply and then perfect it later. As you go along. Yeah. Okay. We're less than 10 minutes to go here, and I want to get one more thing on the table, and that is technology's effect on labor. This from the Financial Times from the end of last year. We've now arrived at a point where technology begins to threaten return on capital, mostly by causing the sort of abundance that depresses prices to the point where many goods have no choice but to become free. This is related to the amount of, quote, free working hours now being pumped into the economy. The result of crowdsourcing and rising productivity levels, thanks in part to the sort of gadgets that allow everyone to work anywhere and anytime in a work environment that's generally speeding up as everyone tries to keep up with the competition by doing yet more hours voluntarily. Okay, Armin, this is right in your wheelhouse. What does all this mean? So three things. First of all, the balance between capital and labor will continue to shift. We know that in all of the advanced industrialized countries, more and more of the fruit of the economic product has been flowing to, the, to capital, people that own technology, people that own venture capital. Um, and that's going to continue to shift. Within the wage bundle, there will be more inequality. So the people that do have jobs will find themselves paid better as the wave of baby boomers finally gets out of the way and the jobs that remain that haven't been automated are good jobs and well-paying jobs and in high demand. On the other side of that are the low-skilled people whose routine either mental processes or physical processes become automated. So you've got machines, robots, artificial intelligence doing stuff that is totally mechanized, totally routine, or that can be done on the other side of the world with much cheaper labor, and it's as if they're virtual, as, as if they're here in the same room. So you're going to see more inequality. You're going to see more of our uh, the fruit of our economic activity flowing to owners of capital. And then the third thing is going to be this kind of micro jobs. Right, So you might be employed and you're constantly looking for work, which means you're going to work for less, you're competing with everybody. Um, I just did something with a group of people about the next generation of employment for you know, Generation Next and how the typical 25-year-old today has had about two dozen jobs by the time they reach 25. Hmm. And in about five years, 10 years, they're predicting they will have worked 250 micro jobs. Hmm projects by the time they're 25. Michael Lynn, can I get you to uh, tell me whether you agree or disagree with that characterization? Well, I think if you take a longer view, uh, labor-saving technology has always led to shifts from certain sectors, such as agriculture and industry, and now into services. Uh, what we're seeing uh, in the United States and in other developed countries is most of the jobs being created are in non-traded domestic service jobs, many of them fairly uh, poorly paid. Uh, nursing aides, for example, uh, uh, or uh, uh, janitors, uh, daycare uh, personnel. Uh, it is a political question whether these jobs, which cannot be automated and cannot be outsourced, uh, pay middle class wages or not. And, and uh, different societies uh, organize themselves differently. So you can have one country in the 21st century where it has a sort of Downton Abbey class hierarchy where most of the people are servants for a few rich owners of the robot factories. You could have another social democratic country where the people who are the working poor in a country like the United States, uh, say the nursing aides, uh, have, are, are part of a prosperous middle class. One of the great myths that has been spread uh, by uh, uh, people in recent generations is that governments have no power. Uh, the truth is uh, most labor markets actually are not in international competition and, uh, and increasingly most jobs cannot be done by machines. So that really should give uh, the workers and the citizens uh, a considerable freedom to use politics to structure labor markets in the interest of a middle class. Pina, let me get your view on this. It, it sounds like the portrait of a future society where if you're not incredibly well educated and lucky, it doesn't sound that good. What do you think? Well, I worry of, from, a, from uh, an access to justice perspective, too, because when we're talking about income inequality, then that will disadvantage those that, the small guys that don't have the resources. 
so that they're not able to advance their rights and even taking it back to something like the patent system where they have an invention, they're not even able to try and protect it unless we're able to foresee things and have an infrastructure in place, be it the legal system, the, you know, the prizes, all those things together to uh, try and, and prevent it from happening. Brian, does this future look worrisome well, to you? I was just reminded, I don't know if Michael saw this in the New York Times on Sunday, there was an article about upward mobility in the United States that said it has never, ever been worse. And uh, mobility in the United States is worse than at any time in its history and worse than most European countries. Uh, uh, so that's interesting that uh, while Obama and, of course, Americans always talk about that, it is, in fact, uh, according to this New York Times article, which I'm afraid I don't remember, the, the, maybe Michael saw it uh, last Sunday. Well, that's a, that's but, but, a, but this, is, this is, if I can, if I can respond to sure. that, this is not because of technology alone. It is because uh, in the United States, unions have been crushed, the minimum wage has been eaten away by inflation, uh, and you've also had a flood of very low-skilled immigration, which has depressed mm -hmm. wages at the bottom mm -hmm. for 30 years. If you look at Canada, uh, many of the same jobs that are, are, are performed by the so-called working poor in the United States are actually decently paying jobs in Canada. So this suggests there are institutional factors. It's not just technological determinism. I, Why would I we would, be doing well on that? I, I would actually yeah. completely agree with yeah. Michael that, yeah. that technology doesn't present a kind of dystopic or utopic yeah. option. It's within our control how we want to harness the abundance that it creates. Uh, but w I guess one of the interesting things I would say to Michael is uh, don't count your chickens before they're hatched because in Canada we have been doing in the last few years we've just been following lickety split in the American trajectory of uh, allowing minimum wages to erode actually having a hate on for unions um, of any description, private or public sector, and also just flooding the low-skilled job market with temporary foreign workers that increases competition. So there's a lot of those same pressures at work, but none of them are like written by the invisible hand, hmm. right? We can, we can right. actually change all of this. I want to thank all of you. And actually, just speaking of the New York Times, I think I read on the weekend, 11.4% of Americans are unionized today, lowest figure in 100 years. Chew on that for a while. Okay, Michael Lynn from the New America Foundation, we thank you very much for being there on the line for us from Washington, D.C. Appreciate your participation today. And up here in the studio, Armin Yalnesian from the CCPA, Pina D'Agostino from York University in Osgoode Hall, Brian Gray, Norton Rose. Thanks so much, everybody. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.